Well, I have a true story for you this morning. I actually kind of wish this story wasn't true, but it's a story about a lady who went to church every single Sunday. I mean, every Sunday. It rained, snow, whatever, she was, she was always there. And this lady would even wake up early in the morning, every morning, and she would start her day by reading her Bible for a half hour. It's like, well, that's cool. Good, good job, right? And then that lady would, would proceed to spend a half hour or even more praying for her kids and grandkids by name. It's like, wow, this is, this is all sounding very impressive, like good, good stuff. Well, one day this, this lady got pretty sick. She got pretty ill, came down with a sickness and had to go to the hospital. And uh, she spent uh, a, a few days recovering from this illness, and she pretty much just slept through the whole day for those few days. And a pastor came to visit her. And she seemed to be doing better, right? She was almost like on her way out. She was sitting up, talking uh, much better. But as she started talking with the pastor, the pastor could tell that something was very wrong, like something's not right here. And the lady finally admitted to the pastor what it was that she was so worried about, so anxious about. She said, I am terrified that something really bad is about to happen. It's like, uh-oh, tell me more, right? Tell me more. Um, well, pastor, I skipped praying for a day or so in there for my kids and grandkids. It's like, okay. You, you were praying for him this morning, though, right? right? Like, you, that, you just told me you started your day praying for your grandkids this morning. I, I'm sure they're going to be fine. But pastor, the problem is, I left my Bible at home, and unless I read my Bible for at least 30 minutes beforehand, God won't listen to my prayers. Hmm. If you were a pastor, what would you say to this lady, right? What would you tell her? Now, the reason why I remember this particular story so well is because that pastor, it wasn't me, that pastor turned to the lady and told her something I have never heard a pastor say before, ever, right? He turned to her and told her to stop reading her Bible for a week. <laughs> Take a Sabbath rest from reading your Bible. Can you say that? Sort of like, is that okay to say? Like, oh man. And afterwards, the, the pastor even had to explain. I was like, why did you say that? Afterwards, he, he explained that uh, he said that to the lady because the lady was struggling to understand the gospel, the good news about Jesus. See, her entire relationship with God was based on active performance, doing something checking all the boxes, doing all the tasks, and she was basically trying to like, be perfected by human efforts. And it's like, is reading the Bible bad then? Well, no, that's not the point, right? The point is her relationship with God was based on active performance instead of active faith. There's a big difference. And that pastor told her to stop reading her Bible for a week, basically because he was trying to intentionally disrupt her active performance, right? He was throwing a monkey wrench into her checklist of tasks. Now, it's been over a decade since that story took place. And I've had a lot of time to think about this story off and on through the years and sort of imagine like, man, what would I have done in a scenario like that? Just like I asked you, like, what would you do if, if that happened? And I think I would have invited that lady to study the letter of Galatians with me in particular. You know, in order to learn the difference between an active performance and an active faith. We see it in this particular letter. And this morning, that's my invitation to you, right? To, we're going to go through Galatians chapter 3, the first section of it. And, and Paul is going to show us through this passage of scripture the difference between an active performance and an active faith. Now, in this morning's passage, the Apostle Paul is going to challenge us to consider three things. We're 
consider three things, okay, that'll help us understand the difference between active performance, active faith. And those three things we're going to consider is we're going to consider the law, like the Old Testament law. We're going to consider Abraham. And then we're going to consider the blessing. Now, these three different topics, these three different things are all interwoven in this passage. And sometimes it can be hard to follow Paul's argument in this section of Galatians because he's basically braided together three different topics into one argument. So we need to consider, we're going to kind of pull apart the braid, right, and consider each strand individually. The law, Abraham, and the blessing. And although it might not be obvious at first, right now, how these three things are interwoven together, right? By the end of this morning, it'll hopefully make a lot of sense why it is that Paul would, would put those three things together side by side. So let's take a look at our passage, and then we'll examine together these three topics individually. We'll kind of pull apart the braid and then see how it all comes together at the end. Now, before we start reading our passage, before we dive into Galatians chapter 3. I know there are some who, who perhaps missed last week the, the first message in the series. So let me just give some quick context uh, to, before we jump in the passage that we're all on the same page about what's going on in the book of Galatians. So this, this letter of Galatians is, is basically, it comes out of the Apostle Paul and this church network that he planted on a missionary journey in a region of the world called Galatia. And that ancient region called Galatia is modern-day Turkey, country of Turkey. And the letter of Galatians was basically an open letter, right? It was a letter for everyone to read and pass around. And it was circulated through this network of churches in this location. And in this letter, Paul is distraught and upset. He's very upset. This letter is designed to be a rebuke and a correction and part of the reason why Paul's so upset in this letter, he explains in the opening that we saw last week that, that false teachers had infiltrated this network of Galatian churches and they were throwing these churches into confusion. They were leading them astray. In fact, Paul says in the opening of this letter that these false teachers have perverted the gospel of Christ. And so Paul writes this letter of Galatians to basically re-evangelize these churches. So the letter of Galatians is essentially a crash course on Christianity. Pretty awesome. Six short chapters gives you the, the crash course, very concise on what it is and what it means to follow Jesus. So, we know the context. Let's dive in to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read uh, the first 14 verses together. And then we'll unbraid those strands and start considering things. So verse 1 says, You foolish Galatians, hmm, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you have heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the, the Gentiles, the non-Jews by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. 
Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now as we read through this passage, it might be a little confusing, right? Because there's basically three different topics, three different topics to consider that have all been interwoven together. So let's start first by just considering the first topic. Let's take this apart, take them one at a time. Consider the law. Now the law is this word that comes up pretty often in this section. Apostle Paul makes multiple references to the law. And the law, what that means is he's referencing the law of Moses, right? In particular, you can think of like Mount Sinai and, and, and in this passage, Moses, or, uh, uh, Paul is gonna quote from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Deuteronomy twice and Leviticus once. And so th- those are the books that he's directly quoting from. This is the section where he's, he's thinking of, he's thinking of these, these laws of Moses when he talks about the laws. Now the issue that Paul is addressing about the law, this, this tension point, it has to do with the false teachers. Remember that we saw about last week And these false teachers are telling the churches in Galatia that they need to become culturally Jewish. They need to become culturally Jewish in order to be fully righteous. Basically, they were being told that they need to live according to the laws of Moses in order for God to fully accept them and bless them. And the starting point for becoming culturally Jewish was circumcision. So it becomes kind of an apex topic And basically these false teachers were telling people that their relationship with God was based on active performance. On active performance, something they had to accomplish. Something they needed to actively do. They needed to to check all the boxes. They needed to become Jewish. They needed to start keeping all the laws and customs. Now in this passage, Paul completely tears apart this argument, right, from these false teachers. I mean, he destroys it. I, ironically, what Paul does to, to say, no, this is, this is not correct, is he actually quotes the law of Moses itself, right? Directly quotes it. Paul begins quoting from Deuteronomy. And I'll put the quote up on the screen, Deuteronomy 27, 26. Cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out. Now, Paul rightfully points out that, that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Like, we, we all fail to check all the boxes to fulfill all the laws of Moses. And so therefore, right, if our relationship with God is based on active performance, if it's based on being a good person, if it's based on keeping all the laws, well then the law itself says we are cursed. We're cursed. But get ready. Because Paul is about to like smack us in the face with the real gospel, the good news, right? In verse 13, he said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is anyone who is hung on a pole. See, we were unable to be perfect and check all the boxes The law itself declares that because of that, like, we're cursed. But the good news is that Jesus has redeemed us, accomplished what we were unable to do. Like, Jesus perfectly fulfills the laws. But despite Jesus earning the blessing, Jesus instead receives the curse of the law. See, Jesus gives us the blessing that he deserved, And he takes from us the curse that we deserved. He gives to us the blessing he deserved and takes from us the curse we deserved. So Jesus is the true hero, the hero of our life story, right? Jesus transforms us from guilty to innocent. Jesus, it goes from cursed to blessed. So as we start thinking about and considering the law, this first section, and we start to compare, like, what is an active faith versus active performance? 
What do, you, what do we see being revealed that's different between these two as we try to compare them? Well, an active performance would look at the law of Moses as a responsibility for us to accomplish. Active performance. But an active faith looks at the law of Moses as a responsibility for Jesus to fulfill. There's more to come on the law. Hopefully, hopefully I actually didn't answer all your questions. Uh, there's hopefully more questions that come to mind with it. Otherwise, next week would be a little boring, right? Because Paul goes in depth in the next part of the chapter explaining the purpose of the law. Like, why, why was it even there in the first place? What was God doing through the law? What, what, what role does the law play? But let's consider on and, and, and consider Abraham. Remember, all these three elements in this passage are interwoven. We've talked about the law, but even as we start talking about Abraham, considering Abraham, we might inadvertently answer some questions about the law. So quick background. Consider Abraham, the second big topic that Paul brings up in this passage. We hear this guy's name, Abraham, and Abraham is the patriarch. He's, he's the founding father of Israel and Judaism. And here's something wild, though, to consider about Abraham. The basic underlying principle that, that Paul's trying to, to point out to us in this passage. See, Abraham's relationship with God wasn't based on the laws of Moses, performing the laws of Moses. I mean, come on. <laughs> the laws of Moses, Mount Sinai, that's 430 years after Abraham right? That's, that's long ways afterwards. And so Abraham's relationship with God wasn't based on the laws of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. They didn't even exist yet. And FYI, right? A little for you, like, and, and more details. Abraham's core relationship with God wasn't even based on, like, circumcision, right? All the quotes that Paul makes in this passage come from Genesis chapter 12 through chapter 15. And circumcision doesn't come along till chapter 17 afterwards, right? So th this is all like before the law, before all these Jewish customs. Uh, Abraham's relationship with God wasn't based on active performance. And, and we know that because all the Jewish laws and ordinances didn't exist in these passages he's quoting from. Like, it, it's a kind of a clever argument that Paul's making here in this passage. But the question emerges, wait a minute, if all the Jewish laws and ordinances didn't exist in this passage from Genesis 12 to 15, well then, what was the foundation of Abraham's relationship with God? Now, the origin of Abraham's relationship with God starts in Genesis chapter 12, and it begins with basically God telling Abraham something crazy. God comes and, and starts talking to Abraham and he says something just wild, sort of off the wall to Abraham. He says, Abraham, uh, you know, pack up everything you own. Sell your house. Like, leave everything you know behind and come follow me to a land that you've never seen before. God meets with Abraham and basically says, come follow me. And Abraham responds, okay. Okay. See, what, like what great deeds did Abraham do previous to Genesis 12? You're going to have a hard time finding them, right? Because Abraham doesn't earn this, this blessing and acceptance from God. No, Abraham simply says, okay. And then he starts walking, right? See, Abraham's relationship with God wasn't based on active performance, a checklist of things to do, making sure he, he's wearing the right clothes. or all, like, Instead, Abraham's relationship is based on an active faith. Abraham believed God and responded. Abraham trusted that God would be faithful to his promises. Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
the righteousness that Abraham had, right? That, that right relationship with God, the foundation of Abraham's relationship with God was simply an active faith. Everything else, all the laws came afterwards. They all came afterwards. And did you catch that, that Abraham, in that passage we just read, as we were reading through it, there was something wild Paul said because he said that Abraham was actually a messenger of the gospel, the good news, right? Like God was announcing the gospel to Abraham in Genesis 12. The gospel is, is what that active faith is fueled by. Let me read it again for you, verse six. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So as we're comparing active performance versus active faith, what those two look like, active performance as we think about Abraham, as we consider Abraham, active performance basically tries to replicate. Replicate the actions of people in the Bible. It's about doing the same things. But an active faith instead gets inspired by the the faith of people in the Bible, the examples of people in the Bible. See, active performance says, I need, I need to do this and this and this, and an active faith says, wow. Like Abraham sold everything he had and started just walking. He didn't even know where he was going. He just started following the Lord's call. That is incredible. Now, side note, side note, okay? Have you ever wondered how people in the Old Testament were saved, experienced salvation before Jesus? Like, how could that have happened before Jesus? You know, if we're listening closely to Paul in this passage, um, I sort of wonder if we ask Paul that question, like, how would someone in the Old Testament be saved before Jesus? He probably would have given us a funny look. Our question might even not fully make sense. He would probably say, wait a minute, Abraham showed us how to be saved. Like, we're not showing him. He was showing us. Like, we are all saved the same way Abraham was saved, right? Like, there, there wasn't something different that came along. See, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Our relationship with God has always been based on an active faith. But more on salvation in the Old Testament next week. We'll get into more of some of those details. Let's consider, and move on, consider that third topic. We're already seeing them start to weave together. Abraham and the law. But let's consider the blessing. The blessing. Now that phrase, the blessing, comes up a lot in this passage. And again, these three elements, the law, Abraham, and the blessing are all kind of interwoven. And the blessing in particular is one where that, that's really this concept that, that Paul starts what we were just reading. Like the beginning of this passage was about the blessing, and the end of this passage is about the blessing, and the blessing is sort of woven all the way through. So I suppose it would be good to define what is the blessing, right? What is the blessing? And to do that, we're actually going to read the end of that passage that we just read, that last verse in verse 14 one more time. Because Paul describes for us what the blessing is. It says, he, as in Jesus, redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. See, Paul notes that the blessing, right, that was promised to Abraham, that, like the blessing is not the law. Remember, the law brings a curse, this whole thing that Paul was talking about, like if we're not able to completely perform the law. Uh, the blessing that God promised to Abraham is the Holy Spirit. It's God's very presence fully dwelling in our life. 
The Holy Spirit arrives through what Jesus has accomplished. And that is how that statement is fulfilled, right? Like all the nations on earth, like all the nations will be blessed through you. Now, Paul has a very pointed question at the very start of our passage. Sort of a jab, okay? And we might not have picked up on what it was that he was getting at with this very pointed question until now. So let's go from the very end of the passage to the very beginning, okay? In verse 2, Paul has this very pointed question. He says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? See, it makes sense why this question is so significant. Like, why is this the big question? I want to know this one thing from you. And it's because this is the blessing promised to Abraham, right? Paul's asking, how is it that we received the blessing? I love the little ones. Paul's asking, how is it that we receive this blessing, right? Remember, Paul planted these churches. He had been standing there. He was with them when he explained about Jesus. He, he was there when they believed and received the Holy Spirit through an active faith, not active performance. And so Paul goes on. He doesn't let up. Right? He kind of takes that question, he pokes, and then he twists a little bit, right? It's uncomfortable. In verse 3, he continues, Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by your believing what you have heard? See, the blessing comes through Man, an active faith. That's his point. So as we compare an active performance versus active faith with this last section, an active performance, it strives to obtain the blessing. Like we're working and working and working because we're trying to get the blessing. The Holy Spirit, right? But an active faith looks way different. It lives in response to receiving the blessing. An active performance, man, we are working and striving, trying to make ourselves good and worthy. And an active faith, an active faith, it's actually the Holy Spirit that's working and striving to make us good. It looks different. Spoiler alert. This is kind of where Paul goes at the end of this passage, like the fruit of the Spirit, that whole concept. So we've, we've considered the law, we've considered Abraham, we've considered the blessing, we kind of see how all three of these are kind of tied together. We're able to better differentiate like active performance versus active faith, how they're so different, how they look different. But let's just take a moment and I want us to just think about what it would look like for us in our life to move towards an active faith, to have an active faith. If that's the core, if, that's, if, that's, if it's not the performance, if it's, man, that active faith, what would it look like? And I know this passage is, is kind of complex, like three topics interwoven, and so I figured we would just keep it very simple and straightforward, right to the point. What is an active faith? faith. An active faith is as simple as listening when God says, come follow me, and we respond and say, okay. And then we start walking. Or perhaps an active faith, it, 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 it maybe is, is listening when God says, I need you to lay that thing down that you've been carrying. You need to put that down. You, you, need, you need to, like, that's getting in the way. You need to stop carrying that. 
and come follow me. And an act of faith says, okay. And we put that thing down and we start walking. We continue walking. You know, an active faith sometimes, it's listening and, and God tells us, hey, you know, I had you set something down. I actually need you to pick something up and start carrying it, right? You'll need this if you're going to follow me. And an active faith says, okay. And we pick up our cross and we start walking, Right? See, an act of faith is listening when God says, hey, come follow me. We say, okay. We start walking. And an active faith is, is different from an inactive faith. Maybe I should clarify. An inactive faith is when God says, come follow me, and we say, okay, but we don't start walking, <laughs> right? But that would be like Abraham saying, Awesome right? Like, wait a minute, that, that's not, that's not the, the faith that was, that was righteous. It, it was that faith where he said, okay, don't know where we're going, but I'll start walking. You know, circling back, thinking about that lady who would read her Bible every day, pray. I think part of the tragedy of that story, the thing that we go, wait a minute, what's going on there? We start to realize that that lady was, was actively performing, was working so hard. She was working so hard because she was trying to receive the blessing. She was working, trying to like get the Holy Spirit, trying to hear the Holy Spirit say, man, you're my child. You're loved. You're accepted. She was working and working and working. And the second she stumbled, all she heard was the curse. Not good enough. Man, an active faith is different. There's been so many stories through Scripture so many stories of, of these heroes of the faith. And they all kind of sound like this. God said to Abraham, come follow me. He said, okay, and started walking. God basically said to Moses, come follow me. He said, okay. Well, there's a little bit of, he fought with him a little bit there, right? He kind of like, he eventually said, okay, and started walking. God said to Peter, come follow me. He said, okay. And he started walking. So basically, it's the same story over and over and over. And when God comes and says to us, come follow me, an active faith says, okay. And we start walking. And that's how we receive the blessing. That's how we experience the Holy Spirit working in our lives. That's, that's actually ultimately how we become good, right? We don't start, like that's not the starting point. That's, that's what happens as we start walking down the road and the Holy Spirit starts working in our life. Come follow me. Let's pray together. So Father, as we, as we think through, man, Galatians, as we think about Abraham, as we think about the law and the blessing, man, we see that our story isn't actually that much different. If, if, if we're working and laboring and trying and working and we're just not getting anywhere, we just keep stumbling. Paul reminds us that, man, 
an active performance, a checklist of things to do, even good things, even reading our Bible in the morning and praying for a half hour. And it's missing something. And there is this moment in our life where we will only ever be declared righteous if we see what's happening in Abraham's life. Before the laws, before the checklists, God comes to him and says, follow me. He says, okay. And he starts walking. I pray that as simple as that is, that we would just remember that that man is an active faith. And that leads to a blessing. That leads to Jesus, man, taking on a curse on our behalf to heal us. It leads to that path as we keep walking, man. It, it, it involves the Holy Spirit coming and being a part of our life. It involves the Holy Spirit doing powerful things in our life, transforming us from the inside out. All those things that that lady was trying to do to earn, they're a gift from an active faith that says, okay, I'll start walking. I pray that you would, you would help us to come back to that truth over and over, the gospel. To say, okay, what's next, Lord? What are you asking? Do I need to set something down? Do I need to pick something up? Do I need to make a left or a right? Like, do I need to sell my stuff and go to an unknown land? Whatever it is, I'll come follow you and start walking. So God, I pray that that work would take place in our heart as we seek and follow you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.